Hi everyone, my name is Raziel Kane and I'm back with another Arcade's voice acting. I've spotlighted many voice actors so far, all from the Transformers G1 cartoon. And you know what these fantastic people have in common? They all had to perform their lines under the demanding Wally Burr. I've been toying with the idea of covering Mr. Burr for a while, because I think he's more responsible for the success of the show than he's given credit for. It's not often that you hear praises for a voice director, and I wanted to change that. Therefore, let me show you what I found on Mr. Burr and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Born on June 2nd, 1924 as Walter Story Burr. This guy suffers from what I now call pre-internet syndrome. It has been difficult to find anything about him, but I did find out about his military history as he was in service during World War II. I can only give you a very abbreviated version of his tale, which he told in an interview for ThirstOnTalk.com. Wally recalls that for a period of time he was the youngest commissioned officer in the United States Army. He had graduated from Culver Military Academy in Culver, Indiana, and two days after his 18th birthday, he was sworn in. His mother had to sign on a permission in order for him to accept the officer's commission. He received an intense two-year training at the highly decorated Fort Cavalry Group in Fort Meade in South Dakota. Then without knowing the destination, he and his troop boarded the British troop ship the Highland Chieftain for a 21-day trip, zigzagging the ocean to avoid German U-boats, ending up in Liverpool, took a train with blacked-out window to the Goodwood Estate belonging to the Duke of Richmond, and trained again for six months. From there, they went to the port of Southampton, where the biggest invasion fleet in the history of mankind was assembled. As he tells it, his troops were held for reserve, to be thrown in when needed. After the Allies secured the coast of France, Wally and his troops tried to take back the port of Cherbourg from German occupation, but found the area very well defended and had to pull back, his leg being wounded and infected. Wally was taken out of combat for a while and claims he missed some horrific battles he probably wouldn't have survived. Afterwards, Wally recounted participating in the battle at Bulge, took on the job of calculating the angle of fires for the big guns with a slide rule, was part of the first troop to cross into Germany from the Siegfried Line and helped free the concentration camp at Nordhausen. After the war in 1946, he was promoted to captain. He was 21 years old. After surviving this very intense once-in-a-lifetime event, he enrolled at Northwestern University. Wally wanted to help mankind, so he tried medicine, but it wasn't for him. But since he could talk and was interested in literature, he went into theater and broadcasting. He graduated and worked in TV for a while, but found live shows very prone to mistakes. So he decided to join a film production company where he became a voice director for commercials. Then a large ad agency hired him, and he transferred to their Hollywood office. After about a decade, he got hired at Hanna-Barbera to promote their commercial making capabilities, but he said that he wasn't good at that. Instead, he began directing cartoons, and eventually started his own recording studios, Wally Burr Recordings. Wally had noticed a lot of production was done with too little preparation. He was, at the time, reading George Bernard Shaw's thoughts on directing, and lack of preparation was a major point of his. Just thinking how you wanted the performance to go, and in as much details as possible, would help a director keep his production steady, even if what you didn't plan for happened. Preparation was a tool that helped you come up with alternative and solutions when the unexpected showed up. From Wally himself, he said that he was pretty quick to see a scene in his mind, that he could articulate to others how he felt the scene should play that people tended to agree that his ideas on how a scene should play was entertaining, that he had fun doing this, and that he could make a living doing it. And us, we get to enjoy what he did, over and over again. Let's start with his directing resume. His first directing credit goes to The Addams Family, and then Super Friends in 1973. Then in 1974, he directed Hong Kong Fui and Valley of the Dinosaurs. Then three more shows in 1976, being Clue Club, The Mumbly Cartoon Show, and Dinomat Dog Wonder. His three last shows of the 70s were Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels, Laugh Olympics, and Godzilla. The 80s were particularly good to him because he got to voice direct a lot of shows that are well remembered today. It started with Spider-Man in 1981, Meatballs and Spaghetti in 1982, Inspector Gadget in 83, and Galavance in 1984. 
Then Wally directed the shows that created the greatest memories of our childhood. Working with Sanbo, he would direct what is considered their shared universe, being Transformers, G.I. Joe, Gem, and Inhumanoids. He also worked on Bigfoot and the Muscle Machines, Robotics, both the Transformers and G.I. Joe movies, as well as Visionaries, Knights of the Magical Light, and Dino Riders. But one thing that surprised me more than anything is that he directed the English dubbing of my favorite anime movie, Akira. Tatsuo! Then in the 90s, he directed the animated special used for public school and class purposes, Spider-Man Don't Hide Abuse. Please leave a comment if you remember that. He directed Bucky O'Hare and the Toad Wars, and its follow-up game by Konami. He also directed My Little Pony Tales, Conan the Adventurer and its spin-off series Conan and the Young Warriors, directed Exo Squad, where he also was the casting director, in addition to working on two video games, Chaos Island, The Lost World, Jurassic Park, and Starshot's Space Circus Fever. He ended his directing career in 2006 with the video game Charlotte's Web, Wilbur and Friends. But that's not all he did. He also did voice work himself. He was the Atom in the new Super Friends Hours and Super Friends, but also Sandman in Spider-Man. On the Transformers, he did a couple additional voices and would replace other actors when they weren't available such as voicing Sea Spray in his PSA when Alan Oppenheimer wasn't available. I guess you know you should have worn a life jacket. Accidents can happen and a life jacket's good protection. Or providing the voice of Jazz in the episode Crimsy. Maybe this will slow it down so we can find out. He also replaced Don Messick as Ratchet in Masquerade. You're just fine as is, Ironhide. And John Stevenson as Thundercracker in War Dawn. Yeah, they sure used to give us a pounding back in the old days. But he voiced some original characters, such as King Nergil in Atlantis Arise. Perhaps we may be allies, Land Dweller. The Dancetron promoter in Autobop. Hey, you can! Back off, creep. And a reporter in Only Human. Is it true, Chief Turan, that these bombings were engineered as a distraction to cover the attempted theft of the neutronium? He was both Arvi Gabor and Emmett Benton in Gem, Close McCall in Bigfoot and the Muscle Machines, Rao in Fist of the North Star, and Larry Buck in Crying Freeman. He also worked on four video games, such as three characters on Stonekeep, Wang Zong in both Dynasty Warrior 5 and Warriors Orochi, and finally Rock in Soul Calibur 3. All this is only his credited work. There's a whole lot more on his IMDb profile where it's mentioned he did uncredited work. In the end, if it wasn't for Wally Burr, I don't think collectors and YouTubers would have the same hobbies today. Wally is one of the main reasons, if not THE main reason, why we have such an iconic voice track for the show we all love. Honestly, even if the voice actors I covered all say he was a taskmaster and a drill sergeant to work with, they all confirmed that he ensured that they all gave their best performance at all times, and that the quality of the voice tracks were so good because of it. Everyone might mention that he was hard and would beat actors to a pulp with his recording sessions, that he's one of the main reasons the SAG went on strike to limit a recording session to 4 hours, and that according to Michael Bell, he's the one who killed Orson Welles, they are all grateful to have worked on such iconic shows with Wally, and that they are remembered because of those shows today. Unfortunately, Wally passed away on July 9, 2017 at age 93. I'll leave you with this interview segment from Neil Ross on the 25th anniversary edition DVD box set of the show, and it says it all. I've never heard him say this, but I've always said Wally would be entitled to say, listen, there's two shows that you guys are really remembered for. There's two shows that invite you to come to conventions and make speeches and make DVDs. And they just happen to be these two shows I directed. Now maybe it's a giant coincidence, or maybe my extra effort and the extra effort I required of you guys was worth it. And I would say he's entitled to say that, and I would agree with him. I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview of Wally Burr's career. If you did, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Also leave a comment, I really like reading you guys. Keep coming back, I have more on the way. And remember, nothing in life gives you the right to be an asshole. Take care.